and hello everyone. Um, today, Chris Sharp is going to be uh, giving us an introduction to Bash, and I will just turn it over to him because there's a lot to cover. Okay, so I'm willing to adapt what I've got here to match what people already know, and um, you know, I, last thing I want to do is is dumb things down or or, or talk talk beneath what your skill level is, but I do want to start with basics and, and move, move up, uh, for there, from there. Um, I'm willing to be interrupted with any questions along the way. So just, uh, you know, you can chat them or you can just speak up. This is a small enough group. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, I'm going to be the dumb person in the room. So feel free to dumb it all the way down. It's cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like, even if you know this stuff or, or work with it all the time, you may not even think about kind of what you're doing. And that I, it helps me to sort of get to know the foundations of things. I, I think probably all of us are like that in the library world, but, you know, most of us anyway, who take our job seriously. So, um, okay. So um, just a little bit, I've got, I'm having to look at my little agenda here. Um, so bash is a shell and that if you've not if you're not familiar with what a shell is that that might need some explanation and really uh, presumably you're running what this meeting on a pc or a, a, a mac that has an operating system and in that operating system you're a user and you have files and you have folders and you have a way that you can navigate around the system you've, you've got menus that you you know point and click um, you can open documents and enter text into them and save them um, you can uh, uh, you, you can do all the things you need to do you can manage your system okay and so in a way windows is a shell or the mac os 10 is a shell or you know that so, so really like in that sense, that's sort of what a shell does. It just gives you an interface that you can work on your computer, with your computer, with the files on your computer, um, or on a remote system. And so that's what a shell is. And originally in, in the early days, and I, I, um, I did a sort of a dry run of this session with Taryn and Tiffany last week, and I, I meandered all over the place. And I, I think I've tightened, tightened it up a bit. Um, I'm going to try to stay out of like explaining what open source software is and the history of Linux and all that kind of stuff. And I'm willing to talk about it um, as much as I know about it. Um, but I, you know, I, I think just sort of getting getting you oriented to Bash and not drifting too far into you know open source stuff in general or history or um, system administration for that matter, because you know there's, there's a lot to talk about. Um, so we're gonna talk about, it, it is inescapable though, I have to talk about the fact that Linux comes from Unix and Unix was developed in the late 60s, uh, gained a lot of use in the early 70s um, and has continued to this day. It's still Unix or derivations of Unix still undergird probably most things we use on the web. And um, one of the way, the main shell that people used in, in um, Unix for a long time was called the Born shell. And that's spelled like Born Identity, B-O-U-R-N-E. Um, and that, that and Unix were both, you know, closed source, you know, proprietary systems. And, in the 80s, uh, you know, a group of software developers led by Richard Stallman, or, you know, a lot of it was done by Richard Stallman himself. Um, you Boston people probably know something about that, maybe. Uh, but uh, he developed a, a Unix clone called GNU, G-N-U, which stands for GNU is not, GNU is not Unix. Um, he loves puns. And he developed a shell for GNU called bash which is a born again shell so again a pun so that's what bash stands for is born again shell um and so just that's 
just to give you an idea of like what we're even talking about in the first place because when you just see bash you're not even sure what that means and, you know we think of bash as a verb um <laughs> and that doesn't really mash uh, uh that doesn't really uh apply here so the other thing, uh, there's other conceptual things are, except for a shell and what bash is. And, and these are things that you're probably familiar with also. It's just users. Like you, you at, when you're a Windows person, I'm sorry, my dogs are going just ape. I need to pause for just a second. I'll be right back. While he steps away, I just need to point out the, the desire amongst the development community, I'll call it that. I don't think that's the right um, phraseology, but to come up with cute names like Bash or Vandalay or things like that, that don't necessarily relate whatsoever to the functionality of the thing. Just just killing time for you, Chris. Oh, sorry about that. Did I miss no, no, a no. question though? No, not at all. I was just commenting on Vandalay and Bash and all the, oh. the naming conven conventions among people that build things to make cute names that don't necessarily yes. correspond to functionality. Yes, yes. There, there, there is a tendency to be clever uh, mm -hmm. in the open source world, and that's rewarded, but it's also annoying to people who are trying to learn something. Oh, a Zool um, runner is always fun to talk Zool, about. Yeah. Yeah, Zool. Yeah, well, yeah. at least Zool actually stood for something. XUL was was actually a, a a a real acronym, and then you know to have it called Zool and Ghostbusters thing and all that whatever. It's amazing. But anyway. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So anyway, as I was saying, you just like on Windows, just like on Mac, you have users, and you are a user, and you have certain, you know things that belong to you on a computer system. Um, you have certain permissions, you have things you can do. Um, let's see, we got a question. I like the silly name. No, it's just me. I'm just oh, making no problem. commentary while you're actually being useful, I'm sorry. Yes, no, 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 <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. I, I'm, I'm still getting oriented. I, I really was thrown off by the dogs going nuts. So i um, trying to get, get my stride again. Um, and on Unix systems, there's a special user called root. Um, and that user is sort of like, it's, it's analogous to the administrator user on Windows. It's sort of got all the powers that are can be used for good or evil, hopefully for good, right? Okay, so you can see my screen here. I've, I've shared it from the beginning. And this is actually kind of what I look at all day is a big black screen with text on it. Um, You'll see that there is, is that big enough for everybody? I made it large print. Like for me, it's huge. Yeah. Y'all can see it all right? Yeah. Okay. You can Great. try it, I mean. Oh, it's it's fine. It's fine. I, I, I just have it really big. Um, I was looking at a recording from our last session and it looked kind of small to me, so made it bigger. Okay, so um, you'll see this thing in green here. This is an Ubuntu system. This is not the computer I'm actually on. This is a remote one. Um, That's my master test server. And I've created a user here called C Sharp. And so that's my username. And then there's the at symbol, like it's an email address or something. And then there's the host name. Um, the host name is the name of the computer. So if you've installed that Ubuntu on Windows thing that I recommended in the um, meeting notes, you'll, you'll see something similar here. Um, if you, um, well, to continue, so I have host or user at hosts, just like email. You know, in fact, email is based on this. Um, colon squiggle. And that colon squiggle is a location. That is where I am right now. Um, and I'll explain what that squiggle means in a little bit. And then there's a dollar sign and then a space. Okay, so like if I hit backspace here, it's not going back any further. Now, the dollar sign is what's called a terminator. And that terminates the prompt. That's what this whole thing is called is the bash prompt. Um, the um, dollar sign indicates that you're a regular user. You're not root. I'll show you an, a different style of prompt is the one that's on my Fedora machine here. 
And that's slightly different. It's in brackets, but it still has the same form. It's Chris at Princeton, which is my host name. And then it shows a squiggle, which is where I am. It doesn't have the colon, but it still ends with a dollar. And that, again, signifies that I'm just a regular user. And then just for illustration, this is the root user on my home machine. So you'll see root at Princeton, and it's, it's got its own squiggle. But instead of a dollar, it has the hash symbol, the, the number sign. And that is an indicator that you're root and, admi and an administrator. It's a visual signifier that shows you who you are at a certain point in time so that you know that you're root. And if, you're, if you do things as root, it behaves differently than if you do things as a user. That's on purpose. That's to protect the system. Okay. So I just wanted to illustrate what prompts do, um, but basically it's who you are and where you are. I'm on this host in this directory, um, and we'll talk about directories in a minute. So if you're all following along at home, um, we're going to learn of, of our first command, which is called echo. And we're going to type echo, and I'm going to say hello there. I'm not going to do an exclamation point because that means something to bash. Um, echo hello there, and it spits out hello there, the text that I wrote. Now note that I didn't put that in quotes. You can just, you know, they're optional uh, some of the time. It's a good idea, though, to go ahead and start using quotes. So it acts exactly the same way. Uh, something else, and you, you can also use single quotes as opposed to double quotes. You know, the regular quotation mark versus the apostrophe do mean something different here. Um, they they act the same when you're just doing text, but when you do when you start having variables and things like that that are part of the text, if you use single quotes, it won't echo those variables back out to you. Um, and we'll, we'll explain a little more of that later. I've, I've got some examples in mind that might be able to help you. Okay, so that, that seems marginally useful, right? You know, it's sort of echo, okay. I type in something, it comes back. That's not super interesting. But what you can do is type echo, hello, there. And now we're going to use a, an arrow or a greater than symbol. And then we're going to name this, we're gonna type this into a file. We're gonna redirect this text into a file. So what I've done is echo, open quote, hello there, close, close quote, space, greater than sign, space, hello.txt. Boom, okay. Now, you'll note that it came back to the prompt. It didn't say that was successful. It didn't say good job. And it didn't say, you know, you did that. Or it also didn't say, are you sure? You know, so the, the, the prompt, the, the bat bash is very much, it's a very quiet, terse program. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not chatty. It just tells you if there's a problem, it'll tell you there's a problem. Um, Echo is actually one of the things that makes it tell you something. <laughs> In this case, if it comes back to the prompt, you should not be nervous. Oh my gosh, did it? It just did nothing. That means it worked. That's good. That's good news. Okay. All right. So, what happened to hello there? What do we think happened to hello there? Well, um, we're going to learn a new command that lists files, and it's called ls or list i even read that list like at that when i see ls I, I i think list in my head i don't think ls um and if i do ls enter all of a sudden there is a uh, a listing hello.txt that looks familiar because we just created that file so this is a file that has text in it called hello um let's see how do I know what's in that file? There are a couple of ways you can find out, but the easiest, and this is good for short files, is to type cat 
hello.txt. Now notice that I didn't type hello.txt. I typed cat hello or H E and then tab and it let me complete. That's called tab autocompletion and that works all over the place. Um, that works for commands, it works for file names, it works for directories, things like that. So if I do cat hello.txt, it spits out hello there. So that's where hello there went when I did echo hello there, it went into this file. Okay, we understand that so far, right? Um, now, this .txt thing, these are very important on Windows and Mac uses them too. That is entirely unnecessary on Linux and you can even do, and you can, by the way, arrow up to go back to commands you've done already to go back into your history. So I'm gonna do a different one and I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna call it hello.pdf. So now I'm gonna see what is in hello.pdf. Hello there. It's not a PDF because I, it, it knows it's not a PDF. So how does it know it's not a PDF? How do I know what file is what? Uh, fortunately, there is a command that shows you what kind of file hello PDF is. And in this case, it tells you that this is ASCII text. Now ASCII is a character set. And I recommend that you Google that and look that up on Wikipedia if you're really interested. But it's kind of an older older character set, um, pre-Unicode. Unicode is what gives us, you know, all of the cool um, foreign language characters. It is it is pretty much Latin text only. Um, so anyway, it tells you that it's ASCII text. So you're using the ASCII character set by default when you're when you're in Bash. Um, if you do file hello.txt and I can even do instead of PDF I can just do hello right so if I do a file listing now I have three files hello hello.pdf and hello.txt and they all have the same text inside so if I do a cat hello hello there right okay so that's a little confusing if you're coming from the Windows world that the file extensions don't matter um, they don't, however, if you're using like desktop Linux or something and it sees a file called .pdf, it might try to open it like a PDF. And by the way, this is kind of how viruses is, exist. Somebody will go in and they'll be in a, you know, they'll, they'll put some malicious code in a file like this and they'll put in file extension .pdf or .j, .jpg or something like that. And all of a sudden you, you've got it on your computer, you open it up and then it runs some scary stuff, right? So. Um, the file command on Linux, I wish there was a, a similar thing on Windows because it would solve some trouble. Um, that's, that's probably one of the things that antivirus software does is it makes sure that the files that are called something actually are those types of files. Okay, any questions so far? I know we're, we're real basic here. Okay, by the way, is this the right level? It is for me, but okay. I'm not the only one here. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't, like I said, I want this to be a useful session. Uh, I'd rather you talk to me and say, hey, this is really basic and I wanna do something more complicated. We are gonna get more complicated, but uh, I just wanna make sure the basics were right. Um, I'd rather you tell me than, you know, leave. So, um, This okay. all makes sense to me. I th think that my biggest um, issue, I don't know that it's an issue, but I don't have good words, um, is that, I am from a Windows environment, and I think this would apply to somebody in a Mac environment too, where I'm used to seeing everything. I, I have the file structure very exposed. Mm -hmm. And so I, as I'm looking at this, I'm wondering, okay, where's that stuff? Great segue. Okay. That's what's next. Yes, we, we, we okay. have not talked about, right, we have not talked about directories or you know they're called folders on windows mm -hmm. or you know on mac mac as well calls them folders okay i do um, call them directories anyway i don't yes. know I, is it like basic training i mean like actually Ch basic language back in elementary school yeah yeah i was gonna say a ch ch children of the 80s probably do know what a directory is yeah um 
I, 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 I think you and I are the same age. I think that we close enough that, we, that we had the, the same, same curriculum. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, okay. So yes, where are we is, is a good question. So I, I mentioned users and every user, just like on windows has a home directory, like where your files are, where your folders are sort of where you land when you open windows, Da, 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 and you have a desktop, right? And this is sort of the equivalent of that. That squiggle there is actually a, an idiomatic way of saying your home directory. So that's what that is. Um, the way you find out where you are whenever you're in a, a Unix or Linux window is to type the command pwd. And that is print working directory. And in this case, it lists home slash or slash home slash C sharp. That that beginning slash is very important. Um, so slash home slash C sharp. And so that's where I am. And that's what so if you do echo squiggle, it will do the same thing. Like it knows what squiggle means. Squiggle is just the way the system tells you um, where you are. Uh, or, or it tells you what your home directory is. So why don't we make a directory? This is like create new folder on Windows and the command is mkdir, make directory, mkdir. Um, I'm just gonna call it stuff, but you can call it whatever you want, okay? So again, it didn't say, are you sure? It didn't say, great, you did that successfully. It just comes back to the prompts. Now, if you do ls, you'll see our three hello files, and then you'll see, in this case, it's blue called stuff. Um, most Linux uh, distributions, Ubuntu, Fedora, whatever, most of the ones you're gonna come across do some sort of color coding like this. It's very helpful um, to know when you look at this that stuff is different than those files. You can also do file stuff and see, it'll tell you that it's a directory. Okay, now how can we put stuff in a directory? Um, to move files, copy or move files around. Um, let's say we want a copy of hello and we want it to go in stuff. So the way copy, which is CP, I read that as copy, just like list, I read as, a, you know, LS, I read as list. Copy, hello, stuff. Copy file one to file two, okay? And if I do that, it's not gonna try to write, it's not gonna try to change the file hello into the directory stuff. It knows what to do. So it just comes back to the prompt. And now if I list, I've still got a copy of hello here. Now I'm gonna clear my screen because I'm getting down to the very bottom. So if you wanna clear your screen, that's control L, or you can type the word clear and that will clear your screen. Um, so, like I said, ls shows that there's something in hello, and if I want to see what's in stuff, I can give ls that directory, and it'll show me what's in stuff, okay? Now, let's say I want to move into that directory. In that case, and this is a command on Windows, I can use the command cd space stuff. Remember, I did it tab complete. It's the only file or anything here that starts with an S. So I can just do tab complete stuff and then enter. And notice that not only am I in a new folder, it tells me I'm in a new folder, right? So now my file path is home Chris, which is what that's, or home C sharp, which is what that squiggle means, slash stuff, right? So that's where I am in the, in the file hierarchy. When you use Windows File Explorer, this is very similar to that. It's just you have to have you have to use your imagination about where you are. Windows, even if you pay attention, if you're looking at File Explorer, if you look up in the bar, it actually shows you the file path. It'll say C programs and files. Da 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 da. da. That's what this is. So the prompt, the prompt tells you where you are in this. Now. Um, Let's say I want to move a file, not just copy, but I want the old copy to not be there anymore. Um, and I want to stay in the, the stuff directory. 
how do I go backwards? <laughs> how do I get back into my file, uh, my, my home directory? If you want to just go to your home directory, you can do CD enter, and that'll just take you back home. Wherever you are in the file system, I want to go home, CD enter home. I'm just home now. You can also do CD squiggle, but that's, that's one extra character typing. So I'm going to go back into stuff. Um, you can go, I want to, let's say we we're like three deep into a file, you know, folder directory, like we're on evergreen all the time. You would do CD dot dot. This is also something you can do on a windows command line. That dot dot is a way of saying the, the directory below this one or above this one, whichever. I, I, I think of it being a hierarchy coming down to a point. Others think of it as a pyramid going down. It's just what, however you think about it, it's fine. Um, so that's, you can do CD stuff, CD dot dot, you're back. Uh, you can also do PWD to make sure you're where you wanna be. Um, you can, let's say you were in a directory a minute ago and you did CD enter and you're like, oh, now I'm at home and now I've got to type all those directory names. Well, fortunately, a bash remembers that and you can do CD space dash and it will put you back in the directory that you just were in. So th these are just nice, nice ways to move around in the file system. Um, and file system might be a new word for you too, but if I, like it's a directory file system like any other. Now, one thing about Windows that's different on, on a Linux box is that there is no C drive. It's just, it starts with slash. Slash is known as the root of the file system. It is not to be confused with the root user. And the root user also has its own home directory, which is slash root. So there's, you know, that's getting a little bit into the minutia. Like I said, it's really hard to stay on the road of, of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here today without going too crazy into other, other areas. Okay, by the way, oh, I didn't, I didn't finish the move thing. So move is MV, that's the command. And if I wanna move a file that's in the directory below, I can, Do that and I notice I, I did tab completion here and now we're seeing some other files and we'll talk about those in a second but let's say I want to move the hello.txt into this file now that last dot that means this directory right here that, that's what that means right okay so I came back to the prompt what happened now if I do an ls Hello, which was a copy of the file that was in the home directory, and hello.txt are both in this directory. If I list home, it now only has hello, hello PDF, PDF. Okay. Um, so when you did that first move command there um, to the parent directory, I'm, I'm going to call it parent directory so as we're not going up or down, if that's correct. Is that correct? This is this is from its parent directory, right? Like, yes. So the right. first time you did that, it then provided you with a list of things that were in that directory. Oh, and, here, yes, yes, right. And yes. then the second time you did that with the space period, saying that that's uh -huh. also with the actual file name, then that's what actually initiated that move. Yes, move okay. also takes two arguments. The first argument is the file you want to move, and the second argument is the location you want to move it to. Okay. Now that if you do dot, that means move it to this directory I'm in right here. Right. You can also use move as a rename. So let's say that we don't like the name hello.txt. Mm -hmm. We can do move hello.txt to uh, Frank. And now it'll I change Frank, the name. Frank okay. and hello. Right. So, so move can be thought of as rename if you're just like, oh, how do I rename a file? You move it. Which is a so, weird, it's a weird concept, but that's actually what's happening on Windows too when you do a rename. So in this example, you are you're in the child directory. You called this list of uh, files from the parent directory, mm -hmm. and 
and then the, the second thing is that you moved it to the child directory. Mm -hmm. Can you be in the parent directory and move something into a child directory? Let's see. Yes. So now if I list list out stuff, it's got Frank, hello, and hello.pdf. If I list what's in here currently, I now only have hello and stuff. Cool. So um, we have enough for one more example. No, I'm just kidding. Right, right. Yeah, well, I was going to say I need to create more files, right? <laughs> oh, no, um, we're, so we're good. Thank I, you. I'll, um, and if you ever, th this actually does happen on Linux machines. Um, you never really do this on a Windows machine, but it's some, there are times when you want to just create an empty file. Like you don't need any text in it. You just need the file to exist. Um, and the command for that is touch. And what touch does, if the file, do, if the file exists, what touch does is it changes a date, like a modified date. It's sort of like, you know, you, when you check in a copy in Evergreen, it, it changes the date, right? So this is similar to that. So touch, but if it's not, if that file doesn't exist yet, it'll create it. Okay, now remember our file command, I'm gonna clear the screen, hold on. Boink. Our file command from before will tell us what kind of file Chris is, it's an empty file. Um, you occasionally need to do that. So I now have Chris, hello, and stuff. Let's say that I want to move all of the files that I can see in my directory into the stuff directory. I can do move Chris stuff and move hello stuff, or I can do move star stuff. Of course, it's going to complain because it includes uh, stuff is saying you can't move that to itself, dum dum. So this is an example of when the 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 um, shell is going to talk back to you and say something's going on, right? If if I had not made that error, that'd be but done. did but, it move those other? So it moved the other files yes, anyway. It, it, so if you do a move and star star means everything that's in the directory. So. Um, so I can also do ls star, same thing. That's equivalent. Um, star just means everything you can, everything in the directory. It's called a glob. It's called file globbing. Um, if you want to Google that and explore uh, later, but globbing is very, very useful. So you don't have to do the same command 20 times if you need to move 20 files. This just lets you do. You can also do. Um, uh, let's see. Copy star home. Okay. But now I have copies of everything that was in stuff. And that I didn't have to type out each file. Okay. All right. Okay. So moving on to other things. Let's say I don't want Frank anymore. Frank has outlived his usefulness. We don't want him anymore. We're going to delete Frank. You delete a file with the rm command. And I'm going to do rm Frank. <sighs> Frank's gone. Note, that didn't say, are you sure? That didn't say, you know, successful, whatever. It just did it. Now, we are super trained by Windows and Mac and whatever to have like 10 warnings before something gets actually deleted. So RM can be a dangerous tool. Like if you do our RM star, everything's gone, right? And it just thinks like, that's the other thing about bash. It's quiet and it assumes you know what you're doing, okay? So it's not going to do a lot. Now, if you are a person who's worried about that, you can do RM, I think it's I for interactive. Now this is illustrating another thing. These are called options or flags or, you know, parameters, or whatever. So uh, you do a dash I, you add a dash I to this, and you do, let's say, hello.pdf, rm dash I hello.pdf, enter. Now it prompts. Do you want to do that? And it, you can answer yes or no, Y or N, 
it knows what those are. It's smart. Like this program, like, you know, a lot of computer stuff, they, the programmers or whoever make decisions that you wouldn't have made. <laughs> this is one where it's actually pretty smart. Once you learn how everything works, it's, it's pretty simple. The other thing to know is that each of these commands are really just an entire program onto itself. Like the ls command is actually its own program. The cp command is its own program. Unix and you know its descendants like Linux and um, BSD and things like that are all sets of specific programs with different developers who contribute all this stuff and you know when necessary make contributions. Now these commands have worked the same for my entire life plus. Like these, this is a 50 year old system and these commands pretty much came with from the beginning. And so, you know, if you could go hop in a time machine, go to 1985, open a Unix prompt, and you could type all these commands and they would work exactly like this. Does, does anybody that you know use the dash I? Not as, not, not as a, uh, not as a, a normal thing. Like, you know, some tutorials that you're going to see will add the dash I for, because like they presume that you're a beginner and you might want that, you know, sure. that interactive question thing, but no, no, it's, it's an extra key you've got to worry about, you know, um, you can also make things more verbose. So if I want to copy, uh, Frank, oh, Frank's gone. Sorry. Uh, Chris to my brother, Tommy, um, I can add a dash V and it tells me what I did. So you, you, you can make it talk to you more if you want it to. But again, this is that's extra typing, and really, it's probably it, it would allow you to get into some bad habits. Um, you can also do what's called aliasing. Um, so I can say alias cp cp v. Oops, why didn't that work? This is another command. Man, you can do all kinds of fun uh, string stringing together of, of Unix commands to for little adventures. But man is one. Um, and what man does if oh oh that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I've just got this wrong. Tiffany can put me right maybe. So let's let's say I want to look up what copy does and what its options are. If I do man dash the man space CP, it gives me this nice manual, man for manual, a manual page or a man page is what this is called. And as you can see, it's an extremely complex program. You can do tons of stuff with this. I don't think of copy as being a thing that's complicated, but th this you can get very complex with these commands because they have lots of different things. But it, the reason the, the man page is here is for that one time where you're like, all right, I have this really weird use case where I need to copy this thing to this sort of file and on the way I need it and I need to copy a thousand of them and I need it to change the file attributes as I copy them or something like that. And that is the kind of thing that you would go to the man page for. Like most of the time you just know what copy does. It's like, this is a little like where you're, you're an English speak, speaker, but you still need a dictionary sometimes. You still need to look up some words that, you know, you want to use in a special way or look up a synonym or something like that. That's what these man pages are. Um, a lot, if you're a Linux newbie and you go into certain Linux channels or like support channels for things, Ubuntu is not like this, but there are others that are like, they get really, really mean about like, you aren't just read the man page rtfm read the freaking manual right i mean that's kind of hilarious well I mean, right this is the manual can you imagine being a noob and having to read all of this and well you can't imagine because you are right so like this this right. doesn't make a lot of sense right so anyway um but know that it's there. just being like, explained on how they won't explain. And yeah, I just think the whole yes. thing is kind of comical. I'm getting old, yeah. so now I can laugh about 
if you start going through anything in Stack Exchange, like everyone is just full of like this was already answered. It's like if right. we could right. have found what we would have found it. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. So what if I want to remove a directory? Let's try that. RM stuff. Uh oh. And I remove stuff is a directory, and you're like, I know it's a directory. I just told you to remove it. Okay. The reason it won't remove a directory is that RM isn't meant to remove a directory. So there is a specific command for removing a directory, just like there is for making a directory, and that's RMDIR, remove directory. You can so if you do that, it's still gonna complain. Whoops, I'm sorry. It's still gonna complain. It's gonna say directory not empty. Okay, so you you've tried twice and you still haven't been able to remove your directory yet. That's annoying. The thing you have to do to remove a directory is either go in and empty all the files, or you can say, I want to recursively remove this directory, which is what dash R does. RM dash R, uff, enter. So now it came back to the prompt, which means, hey, that worked. And now I just have these files, my directory is gone and everything that was in it. So the reason that RM and RMD, RMDIR act that way is to protect you a little bit. Like it, there are some safeguards around what you're doing. So you're not just gonna totally blow away the you know, entire project you've been working on that you didn't save, right? That you didn't have a copy of and you didn't store in Git or whatever else, right? So that's what, that's what this, that those are. Okay, um, let's see, we've talked about file paths. We talked about PWD, we talked about changing directories, we talked about tab autocomplete. Oh, it's funny because like when I did this with um, Taryn and Tiffany, we spent like 45 minutes on the LS command because there was there were so many options they're, they're doing. So if we do an LS, it just shows these files. If we do an LS-A, which is all, most of these commands are mnemonic. They provide a little bit of mnemonic to them. All of a sudden, we see more than just those those four files. We see these other files, and we saw those a second ago when I did some tab autocomplete when illustrating move. So, what are these? So you see a dot, a dot dot, and then you see these other files and directories. We know they're directories because they're blue that are preceded with a dot. These are called dot files or dot directories, which is, you know, okay, so what? That is the way that Linux and Unix systems designate a hidden file. So if it's a dot file, it's a hidden file. So if I want to change Tommy to a hidden file, I can change it to dot Tommy and then it, whoops, or that, that's a copy, never mind. So Tommy's still there. If I do ls a, I can now see Tommy and dot Tommy. So why do you want a hidden file? What are those for? Well, just like on Windows or Mac or anything else, there are certain configuration files or something like that that the system needs, that Bash needs, or whatever programs you're using on Bash need. They need a place to store stuff. They just need a little cache or a directory or something like that to stash stuff, stash configuration files, stash data, things like that. But you don't need to care about that. So it creates a dot file, so it stays out of your way. And that's a good example of this. Like you don't want dot Tommy there all the time. You just want regular Tommy, right? So anyway, uh, hopefully that's that's okay. But you, you can, you can view these files. Um, you can do cat dot Tommy. Oh, well, there's nothing in Tommy because that was a touch file, right? Let's do dot profile. Okay, and it spits out a bunch of stuff. Okay, so there's going to come a time where doing echo file, you know, is not going to do it. By the way, okay, here, here's an illustration about what what uh, these what this does so I'm gonna say echo Chris file okay K 
cat file, it has Chris in there. Now, what happens if I do it again with different text? I should have pinned it. Okay, so did it put it, did it add that to the file or did it do something else? We'll find out. Oops. So, what about this? If I do a double arrow oh. file, now what does file have in it? Now it has four. Okay. So, what happened here? This is called clobbering. We talked about file globbing. Now we're talking about clobbering. Uh, clobber, of course, if you go clobber somebody, that means you basically hit them over the head until they fall over, right? So this is what this does to a file. It just blows away whatever was there. Again, this is, you know, like it is a powerful system. It assumes you know what you're doing. So if you say overwrite this file, it'll just overwrite the file. If you want to add a line to a file, you can do this double arrow, and it now has two lines, Taryn and Chris. And if I do it again, it has Taryn, Chris, and Lynn. Okay. Now, this is a very cumbersome way to create files, right? I mean, you don't want to be doing, like, you can't, this is not how Evergreen was coded. So what do you think, what do you think you need to be able to do here? Edit the you file. Need, you need a text editor, okay? All right, now um, I'm gonna start with the hard one <laughs> and then we'll move to the easy one uh, if, it's, if it's even installed. Now on every single system, you're gonna have a command that is called VI, okay? Um, VI is a text editor that's been around since the early 70s. It's one of the original. Um, and it actually was originally a command within a different text editor called ed, ed, ed. And it was the visual mode for ed, because ed was a line editor that was similar to what we were just doing. You would like type a line and then it, it, you add each line to the file and then you'd end up with a file. Um, when you watch or read you know, documentary material about the early days of computers where they didn't even have terminals or UIs or anything. It's amazing what they put up with. So anyway, this is one of those things where they finally were like, oh, now I can like look at a file like on a whole page, which is very primitive to us because we've, we've grown up with Microsoft Word and things like that, right? So, or even WordPerfect back in the days before that, we had all these things. So this is a very primitive seeming text editor, but it's also very powerful. Um, VI, like I said, is gonna be everywhere you go. VIM, is called VI Improved. Again, these cute, fun names. Is And this is what I tend to use. And usually, VI will be aliased to Vim on most systems. Um, so, Vim, uh, what, what do we call it? File. Vim file, enter. Now, everything changed. Our prompt is gone. We're now within Vim. Okay, um, note that there's this file. It tells you what the name is down here. It's three lines and 18 characters. Uh, it tells you where your cursor is. It's, it's on the first line on the first character. I'm not sure what all means here. Um, so Vim, VI slash Vim frustrates the heck out of everybody because if you just start typing here, it doesn't actually type. It just moves stuff around, right? This Vim starts in what's called command mode. And while this is super annoying when you're first learning it, it is actually super, super useful once you know it. Okay, the way you get to the point where you can type in text is you type the letter I, and now you can type in stuff. And it works like any other thing you've ever used. Okay, you can move around with the arrows and, and things like that. Okay, blah, 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 adding text. See, now, now we're in business. We don't have to worry about this echo and cat stuff. We can actually just, we can see what we're typing. We, we're in the file. This is 
an awesome file. Okay. All right. So to get out of command mode, you hit escape appropriately. But how do you exit Vim? That's a great joke. There's so many jokes on the internet about not being able to escape Vim to get out of it. So you're just like for the rest of your life, you just abandon this window, move on with your life because you couldn't exit Vim. To exit Vim, you type colon, you'll see a colon appear in the lower left, Q, enter. And then it tells you no right since last change, add exclamation point to override. See, even I can't exit Vim. Okay, if you want to write out what you've done, you, you can do colon W, enter, and then it tells you 60 characters were written, okay, and then you can do colon Q, or you can add some more text and then do colon WQ all in one motion, and then you're there. Okay, so now if I cat file, it's got that extra stuff in it that I just created. Okay. So Vim is like extremely powerful and it is like not only a different training, it's probably like 10 different trainings. So we're gonna, we're gonna move on and I wanted to talk about the easier one and let's see if this is installed on your system. Try typing nano file. Did that work for you? Or did it say command not found? Okay, I'll assume it worked. This it is worked. actually, okay, it worked for this, me. this one doesn't start in command mode. It starts where you can already type. You can type immediately. Um, and then there's all this stuff at the bottom. Now, fortunately, it comes with its built-in documentation right here about what those are. So the caret symbol means control. Okay, the control key. So if you wanted to make a change, Okay, and then you want to write out, it's control O, and it gives you a, a file name to write. Now we can write it to the same file, which will overwrite what's there, or we can you know, change it to a different file, dot copy or something. Say file under a different name. See, this is a little more Windows-like, right? And so now, now I've written it. And if I get out of here with control X, and I do an LS, you'll see that I have file dot copy. Right. Remember that dot copy or dot txt or dot pdf, they don't mean anything to Linux or Unix. So you can do dot supercalifragilisticexpialidocious if you want, and it doesn't matter what you call these files, okay? All right. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so I and I have nano open and I have the caret commands at the bottom, but I also have what looks like m commands, m dash u, m dash e. What are those on the right? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they are capital M. Well, okay. let's see. I'm not sure actually. I don't use nano. I'll be honest. I like when I first used, when I first learned Net, uh, uh, Linux commands, I did use nano because it was easier. But then, like, when, when I came to GPLS and all the cool kids were using Vim, I was like, oh, well, I need to, I need to know Vim. And I did. I, I, you know, if you're going to be a system administrator at all, you have to know Vim. You have to at least know what Vim does, right? So, you know, you have to know the basics to get into files. Because, like, sometimes, often when you're a system administrator, you're, like, working in some super primitive shell where the only thing that you can use is VI, and it's not even the nice Vim version. It's, like, the super old one with all these limited features. So, um, so yeah, that's that's something I'd have to look up or, or Google. So, Taryn, you should do some research and get back to us. <laughs> okay, listen, we have three minutes left on the hour. I, I didn't want to extend this meeting too far over. Do we want to keep going, or um, is this enough? I've got more uh, content to go over. I, I, I was trying to rush through it. Okay, so I feel like by me saying hey, go ahead and, and dumb this down. I might have co-opted a little bit, but this was super, super helpful for me. So <laughs> I, I will say that. 
I Good. can't speak for everybody else, but I will speak for my own self. Well, I, I will take an extra few minutes and sort of rush through. Thank you for those comments, Ruth. Um, I will rush through a couple of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, I'm going to get out of this now. I'm going to clear my screen. There is another um, option for LS, which is dash L. And if you do that, you're going to see this, what's called a long listing. That's what the L stands for, is long. Um, and you're going to see all of this RWRW stuff on the left. And then you're going to see the name, the username. That's the user. That's the group name. We haven't gotten into groups, and that, that gets really into to Unix stuff. And then we see the, um, the last edit uh, date time and then the names of the files. So that's a long listing of LS. And what these little dashes and RWs are is the file permissions, OK? There are three types of permissions, read, write, and execute. And there are three areas, sort of scopes, where those are applied. So this is similar to Evergreen. If you if you wonder where Evergreen's can, permission complexity comes from, it th these were hardcore Unix guys writing this stuff. So this is a matrix of permissions. So in this case, the user, first of all, the, the first dash is blank on these. If we had a directory here, it would have a D in that spot. The R means write, I'm sorry, the R means read, the W means write, and this dash, if it had something there, it would be an X for execute. So execute means run, because we're not just creating text files that we can read. There are far better ways to create text files in our modern world, right, than writing it in plain text editors on, on, on Unix computers. So we want to be able to write programs that we can then run. OK, um, so this is RWX for user, RWX for group, and RWX for everyone who's on the system, which is often referred to as world, like everywhere, everybody, global, all right? So again, you'll see some parallels in evergreen permissions. So that might be a useful way to sort of uh, useful hook to, to think about that with. Um, so I wanted to also talk about variables. Like I said, I'm rushing through this. So to create a variable, um, you do, I'm just going to do an example here, x equals Bob. Doesn't matter what goes in the variable. And then it comes back to the prompt. So now to refer to that variable, I can do echo dollar sign whatever I named the variable, x. So echo dollar sign X spits out Bob. Okay. Um, so how about name equals Chris? Okay. And then you can do echo, use double quotes. My name is name. My name is Chris. So this this gets into the very beginnings of programming inside Bash. Bash is an extremely powerful programming um, apparatus, especially when you start combining all of those little tools we were talking about into something useful. Um, so why don't we, very quickly, I'm going to create a, a, a script that we're going to run real quick. Okay, I'm going to use Vim. You can use Nano. And I'm going to call it script.sh. So this, in this case, the file extension does matter because it's going to give you some some uh, syntax. Okay. To start a script, at the very beginning, you type hash mark and the exclamation point, which is often called a shebang, like a hash bang or a shebang. Um, and then you type, just trust me on this, then slash bin slash bash. That is the location of the bash binary. That's what, what you're telling it. This is going to be a bash script. That's what you're telling the, um, the, the computer right now. Okay, so we're going to make it really simple. My name is Chris. All right, 
Very simple script. Just going to echo this out. Okay. Copy it out, whatever, write it out. Now you can either, well, the best, the easiest thing to do since we're short on time is to type bash, which we're already using, but bash script.sh. It will run the script. Okay. Now, if you didn't want to have to type bash, you can change the mode. This is changing a permission. I'm telling it, add the executable flag to the user script.sh. Okay, just copy that down if you want to. Then you can do dot slash, forward slash, script.sh. Now, why did I do it that way? Remember that dot is the directory I'm in, and the slash just means the end of the directory. So I'm basically just saying, run it here. The other thing you can do is do home C sharp script.sh, and it'll run as well. But you can do dot slash script.sh. My name is Chris. Okay. Now, with this, we can go back to our script. Remember, we started this whole thing by piping things into files. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm echoing. My name is Chris into new file.txt. I'm copying new file.txt into a new file called newer file.txt, and then I'm going to cat out what's in newer file.txt. Fun things you can do with bash. It's only marginally fun. Whoops. Okay. Looks exactly the same, but there's a lot more going on underneath. So you, this is it. So all, all a bash script does is it takes a bunch of commands that you would otherwise be typing one at a time, and it puts them in a script. Now, you don't have to be a hardcore system administrator to imagine how useful that could be. Um, so, for example, you might create a script that installs Evergreen, for instance. I mean, this that I've done that multiple times. I have one running on um, Terran's and Tiffany's test boxes that just runs through all the different commands to install Evergreen. Now, it's not as simple as what we just did. You have to consider which user is doing what. You have to worry about you know, s substituting things in files and stuff like that. But really, it's, it's very straightforward once you get the hang of things. The final thing I'll leave you with is the fact that Bash itself is running scripts in the background. And so it has its own variables that it uses all the time. So you can do, and in its variables, if you do a, um, if you start echo, and then space dollar tab, you'll see all these variable names. Some of them are in uppercase and some of them are in lowercase. These are called environment variables. Those also exist on, on Windows. Those also exist on Mac. These are things that Tell Bash, how am I going to be dealing with you? Am I going to be speaking English? So I can do echo lang, and it will tell me that my locale is ENUS UTF-8. So that, that's a nice thing to know. I can see what is my shell. My shell is Ben Bash. Okay. Um, or some other, what did I do? Host name. Where, what is my host name? Sharp master. Now that already, you can see the usefulness of being able to do that in a script, right? Because if if you create a script that cares where it is, like what host it's running on, you've got echo host name, and then you've got that available to you when you're writing scripts. So there's tons and tons and tons of stuff you can do with Bash. Um, we've barely scratched the surface. I do think that's a good place to end. Um, as far as the the bash stuff goes and that went about seven minutes over but uh, i think we did okay if we hadn't had the dog interruption at the beginning we'd be a little better so thank you so much chris
Does anybody have any um, questions before um, we stop the recording? Um, I did not get the introductory email for this. And so I don't know if I'm not on the list, that's possible. But if someone could forward it to me, cause it sounds like there was some content in there that. Um, yeah, the um, on the agenda page for the meetings, um, it had the instructions on how to install Ubuntu locally. And that it gives you an environment where you can use this. Okay. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yep. So and so I would say like your, your next steps practicing, I mean, this is assuming like, I, I, th I think several of us might already be doing this, but if you're primary, primarily in a Windows environment, um, it is good to expand your horizons a little bit and have something like this done. Since Windows has developed this um, Linux, what's it called, Windows subsystem for Linux, that that it allows you to install Ubuntu or, or other Linux distributions on there. I mean, it's pretty amazing, first of all, that they did that at all. And second of all, that you have this and it just runs like any other program on your um, on your machine. And you've got a full blown environment there. You can do all kinds of stuff with. You can run all of your Git commands and things like that. Um, but I would say like practice, there are so many Git to, or um, bash tutorials on the web that you could that you could run through um, running scripts and stuff like that. You could, you know, my, my first uh, script that I actually used a lot was just to connect to a VPN. It was called connect to my VPNs.sh. That was <laughs> little little thirty four year old me in in two thousand eight, like creating uh, this thing, and I was so proud of it. And I like kept it up for like years until we changed VPN. Um, <laughs> Technologies and I don't need it anymore, but it's right. probably still on my still on my machine somewhere. But I had it probably so it was, still running in the background. Uh, right, not, well, not I, connecting, not connecting. The, the, the commands were slightly different on uh, Ubuntu and Fedora, so I had it like check: is this a Fedora system or is this an Ubuntu system? And like I was so proud that it did that. I was just like, I just run it and connect. I was so the, it's very satisfying to create a useful tool and. Um, mm. You know, there, there's not a lot of evergreen stuff that's written in Bash, but a lot of those like utility scripts and things like that are, you know, either going to be Bash or Perl. And Perl is like Bash's kind of more sophisticated cousin. So, yeah, one one of the things that Chris did for um, me and some of the others um, here at Pines was he created some scripts that will check the audit tables for us because we don't have direct access to the server tables. <laughs> and so, created a read-only uh, bash script so we could just run it and it would just tell us, you know, give us, okay, what's the whole history of this item kind of thing and it would give it, give it to us. Um, so that's been super helpful. So I'm excited yeah. about learning to write some of my own. Just so you know what Taryn's talking about, I'll share this link. Um, that is a collection of these. Uh, I, I think they might be a little bit out of date from what we're actually running on that server, but, but I do try to put all of our little tools and stuff, most of which are written in Bash, mm -hmm. um, in, in the Pines Contrib repo. So you feel free, people who run consortia, feel free to you know poke in those and um, see if you find anything useful. Because we, we do, if, if we've used it, you will probably use it someday. I mean, it, you know, you, our, our use cases expand probably way beyond most. And if you're running a consortium, especially, there's a lot of useful stuff here. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm going to put stop on the record. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome.